We know that when there are announcements that must be given, and I have that as my fate again. I remind the physicians who are here and wish continuing medical education credits to register at the table near the entrance. I had better repeat the announcement about the Minnesota car numbered MNA-166, a Datsun 210, whose lights are on. You may want to repair that, lest the battery be dead. Next year's conference is an interesting one as well, and follows, I think, very uh, relevantly on the topic today, since the biological area is making greater and greater use of the competencies of the computer. The topic of next year's conference will be the nature of learning, discussing the implications of artificial intelligence. Um, the speakers include Herbert Simon, Gerald Edelman, Daniel Dinette, Roger Sharp, I think it is, I, Brenda Miller, Milner, and A.R. Peacock. Uh, I have a request for those of you who leave the auditorium at the close of the lecture, uh, a request that is um, from people who have made it to me. That if you leave, leave quietly. The noise in the back from even subdued conversation interferes somewhat with the uh, with hearing. There's a little bit of a bounce up here. I I hear each lecture twice. Uh, there's not much we can do to correct those things. Uh, I applaud Dennis and his crew for doing the best they can. This is not just a conference, though. It's a it's a festival. There's a festive air. We get good weather, we get fine music, we get art, we get poetry, we get parables, we get paradigms. <laughs> it's all very lovely. Uh, we don't regard the Nobel Conference just as a strictly academic affair in the narrow sense, but as a, a broadly based uh, celebration of the life of the mind which is not just rational. I hope you enjoy it as such, and we will continue with the program now when my colleague, uh, Barbara Simpson, who um, teaches in the psychology department and counsels in the counseling center, will introduce our next speaker, Willard Galen. Barbara. Thank you, Bob. Good morning. Willard Galen is clinical professor of psychiatry at the Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. He is training supervisor and psychoanalyst at the Columbia Psychoanalytic Center. And he is co-founder and president of the Hastings Center Institute of Society for Life Sciences, which he founded to concentrate professional time for consideration of the very issues posed by this symposium. Will believes that man has the capacity to make reason choice and that he will, through cooperative effort, make responsible choices. He is optimistic about what man can do, at least, and he believes that man is particularly well endowed to face the issues of what we ought to do in this biological revolution. In a book called Doing Good, one of the many that Will has put out, Will says this about man. Coming from the traditions of science and medicine, I stand for man. Homo sapiens to me represents an incredible gap in the great chain of life, a discontinuity that is not measurable in the traditional incremental changes from lowest species of animal to the highest. We are a splendid and 
peculiar discontinuity, Will says. Will, what can you tell us this morning about man? Will Galen. The first thing I have to tell you is that I come here now with a sense of relief. The last time I addressed an audience approximately this size was in Omaha, Nebraska at the American Urological Association. That's urological as in urine, not neurological as in neuron. Uh, I came there and there were some 2,000 surgeons sitting there listening attentively to a lecture on kidney stones and their proper removal. Uh, as soon as the speaker sat down, they introduced Dr. Willard Galen, who was going to talk about medical ethics, and en masse, 2,993 out of the 3,000 people left. So you already have won my gratitude uh, by remaining silently in your seats after hearing my name announced. Uh, there is a kind of nostalgia for me returning to a college campus because it brings back memories of my own first time as an undergraduate in a college campus. Now, I was neither as young uh, nor as handsome as some of the gentlemen who have been taking us around today, but I did have a keen eye for aesthetics and observing things. One of the things I observed that seemed strange to me was a peculiar architectural anomaly on the college campus. That is that there was an incredibly tiny, little, fragile Victorian building, which at one time had obviously dominated an open space. And in the crush for space, this little frame structure had been almost completely surrounded by ugly jaws of a red brick building. And for all the life of me, it seemed to me as though that little fragile structure was about to be swallowed up by these huge monstrous jaws. When I inquired of my guide what they were, the little building was the divinity school, and the large jaws were the buildings of the biology department. Now that was roughly the state of affairs when I was an undergraduate. Biology was about to destroy theology. There was no need for it. And then one of those strange flukes happened, and what happened is that the successes of biology led to a renewed interest in questions that theologians had been dealing with temporarily, but philosophers had abandoned completely. And those were the questions of traditional normative ethics. We biologists, rather than undoing the ethicists, created dozens of new jobs for them, for which I hope they are adequately grateful and thankful to us. I suspect not that having done this favor to them, they will continue to attack us as a danger to the group. Now, how did we go about doing it? Three changes, I would say, uh, led to this discussion. Changes in the success of medicine. I always found that the lessons of my childhood were only half uh, supportive. Uh, my father was a diligent parent, and he taught me that a mature man must take responsibility for his failures. He never taught me that a mature person must take responsibility for his successes. And indeed, that's the problem with medicine today. We suffer from our successes. When I talk about subjects like this in New York, I usually give it an ethnic twist with an ethnic title. Uh, something like the Jewish mother title, after all we've done for you, how can you treat us this way, is the title I usually use. And my answer is, it's because of what we've done for you or us that we are treated this way. And there are three developments, I think, that have focused on this. The first was the whole question of the quality of life. The quality of life questions emerge with the success of medicine. We never had to answer to these questions. As Lewis Thomas pointed out in his um, uh, presentation the first day, medicine up until very recent times was essentially a care and comfort profession. It was not a life-saving profession. But there were certain inbuilt protections against philosophical and theological issues in the way that we were put together. So that the kind of trauma that would be likely to take all of those aspects of you that we associate with being a human being, the capacity to, to, to love, the capacity to speak, the capacity to smell, the capacity to talk, a damage sufficient to do that normally, there were some exceptions, would also take the vegetative processes along with it and you would cease to breathe and you would die. With the development of the respirator, we separated, we cleaved apart those vegetative and those human functions so that we were forced to address the questions of whether that which we were keeping alive on the machine was still human, or even the way you frame the question uh, introduces your bias, or whether what 
when were, was that human being no longer alive that we were sustaining on the machine? This raised questions of quality of life, as did the increasing techniques of surgery, which I alluded to yesterday. At one time, surgery was quite limited, but with antisepsis, we began to have the kind of extravagant surgery we could never have anticipated before. In the old days, it was quite easy. You could decide that surgery had 100 survival days, and quantity was the solution, and quantity was the index of the propriety in medicine. 100 survival days for surgery, that was preferable if there were only 50 survival days for radiation. But when surgery became so extensive, and this was an actual case that was presented to us at the Hastings Center, where you could remove an entire face, surgeons began to question whether those 100 days were indeed as valuable as 50 days of a person who could go out into the community and to maintain his social and his business life. And so surgeons and the rest of us were forced to talk about not just the quantity, the amount of life left for us, but the quality of life that remained. And that was the introductory kind of problems into ethics uh, that we uh, started with. The second group came when we began to deal with drugs, electrodes, and direct intervention in the brain. There was enormous suspicion about our capacity to change behavior through such manipulative devices as invasive uh, mechanisms. And we at the Hastings Center uh, spent some three years trying to say what is the distinction between psychosurgery and uh, electro implantation and television and operant conditioning and behavior modification. It was a very strange three years. You have to understand, in those days, some 12 years ago, there was the then equivalent of the Jeremy Rifkins of today, a man named Peter Bregan, who has since retired from the lecture circuit because no one is any more frightened of the concept of psychosurgery. Now, I don't know that he's retired. He may have joined Jeremy, and he may now be on the genetic engineering panic uh, uh, circuit, but that I don't know. But in those days, there was true panic about controlling and manipulating people from planting electrodes. After the three years, I can't go into that. That's a whole other lecture. I will say that we were a little confused and unsure of how much danger there was. And most of us felt that the dangers of control were probably with low technology rather than high technology, and that term that Karen did like was one that I authored, the Frankenstein factor, and it was meant to be something somewhat different from what Karen said. It was that people generally are more frightened about high technologies attacks on uh, their nature than they are on low technology attacks. When I finally tried to uh, describe the distinction the, in principle between planting an electrode and implanting an idea, the only one that I was comfortable with was that it was probably easier to withdraw the electrode than the idea. And uh, other distinctions seem to fall by the wayside. Well, now we're not so involved with the drugs and the brain, although I do think this is an area for us to be involved with. Now it's genetic engineering that is in the uh, forefront. And with genetic engineering, again, this Frankenstein factor does come in because we are always unhappy when we are changing our nature. And what is happening is a concern that somehow or other we are tampering with Mother Nature and we are going to be made to pay a price for this. Now, I will tell you in advance that what you are going to hear from me is the good news. I bring glad tidings. I am the optimist in the crowd, and I not only think that we probably will tamper with Mother Nature, I think Mother wanted us to do that. And um, uh, I will get into this. Now, this reevaluation, though, has raised questions about what is human nature? What is the nature of the species? And rather than talking about bioethics, I'm going to address myself to a concept called human dignity. Dignity means worth and value, because dignity has been under attack from a number of uh, places. We have come to a point where I have heard uh, people say on campus, people who should know better, uh, spurred by the environmental uh, movement. Now, you're going to hear things that are going to make you think I'm unkind to animals. I am not. I love dogs. I don't kick. Uh, uh, but I do not see them as having any specific status or existence outside of the perceptions, the purposes, and the pleasures of Homo sapiens. I am a pure anthropocentrist. I think it is a better world with the butterflies and the sequoias, but if the people aren't here, you can take them right down the drain with the rest of us. 
uh, so that when I hear young students say, what a wonderful world this would be if there were only no people on it, uh, I tend to bristle because I think that the wonderment of the world is a product of our perceptions and our purposes. Now, uh, I am therefore going to talk about dignity. Dignity has also been under attack. The groves of academe in the last 15 years have been invaded by tigers and foxes and Lorenzes, uh, all devouring our reputation as a species. And I am here to tell you how good we are. Now, the literature on human dignity is a very small one, surprisingly, and a relatively modern one. The ancients had no problems with it. They had no doubt at all that we were special and we were something wonderful. And the ancient Jews, unencumbered by Hellenic concepts of hubris or Christian concepts of humility, saw us as really being at the top of everything. And I quote a familiar quote uh, from what seems to be the favorite source of this conference of the Bible. And in Genesis it reads as follows. And God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he them, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every other living thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now you'll notice that that God didn't talk about our living harmoniously with the nematodes uh, or the viruses of the earth. He commanded that we subdue it. And in that biblical passage, it is not asked of us that we be one among creatures, but that we be supreme among creatures, halfway between man, uh, between animal and God. And that was the commandment that we were given, and I follow that commandment with fervor. Now, we were not alone. The, the Greeks did uh, have a sense of uh, humility and hubris, and uh, they were concerned about it, but still they saw the special uh, place of God. And a little quotation from Antigone uh, by Sophocles, the statement, the world is full of wonderful things, but none more so than man, this prodigy who sails before the storm winds, cutting a path across the sea's gray face beneath the towering menace of the waves. So in the Greek tradition too, the other strong tradition which shaped our culture, there is a very central place uh, for our species. I have so many of these quotations, I have to get them out of the way so that I don't uh, get in the way. Now, for an amazingly long time, the concept of human dignity was built on that quotation from Genesis. We were created in God's image. And that was the special role we had. There need be no question about it. So that our dignity, our special worth, was in that kinship and in our creation. And that dominated a thinking up through the Middle Ages. It was a very special kind of thinking because in the early medieval tradition, the image of God was very much dominated by an Augustinian dualism, that there was a kind of separation of mind and body. And it was only in the soul that we were uh, in God's image. It was with the early Renaissance that we first began to have the concept that there is something very special about our nature and our quality that makes us in God's image, not just in the affinity of souls, but something in the very nature of us. And in two quotations, which I'm particularly fond of, uh, you get the sense, which anticipates much of what I'm going to say, about what some of the special qualities of being a human being are that shape us and that make us a special creature. And one of them, I could not find the exact citation to come here, but it's a quotation from the Talmud, which raises the question, if God had intended man to be circumcised, why wouldn't he have created him that way in the first place? And these medieval scholars, or early Renaissance scholars, answered that God created man alone among creatures, incomplete, with the capacity and the privilege of sharing with his creator in his own design. And that is a very touching and very uh, sophisticated expression of what I think is very special about human nature, our incompleteness. It was also uh, said in uh, somewhat uh, uh, more eloquent, uh, less specific than the legalistic language of the Talmud by a great thinker uh, of the Renaissance. 
uh, Pico della Mirandola, who says uh, in this uh, beautiful quotation, neither a fixed abode nor a form that is thine alone, nor any function particular to thyself have I given thee, Adam, to the end that according to thy longing and according to thy judgment thou mayest have and possess what abode, what form, and what functions thou thyself shalt desire. The nature of all other beings is limited and constrained within the bounds of law prescribed by us. Thou, constrained by no limits, in accordance with thine own free will, in whose hands we have placed thee, shalt ordain for thyself the limits of thy nature. Now, for the most part, little movement was made until a modern time. At that time, then, there became a, a, a somewhat subtle change in, in the whole concept, and it became the concept that there was not just dignity in the species, but dignity in each individual man and woman and member of the species. But this was a gradual kind of change. The most profound change occurred in very recent times, and that occurred with the writings of Kant, who so dominated modern philosophy and modern uh, thinking about ourselves that his definitions of man's worth became ultimately the exclusive definitions of man's worth. And a dignity became an issue in all of our modern writings without ever being analyzed and implicitly, implicitly always carrying a Kantian definition of dignity. The use of the word dignity and the proliferation of dignity in international law and in international contracts is so great that I first became interested in this subject when a professor of international law, Lewis Henkin, said to me, what do you psychiatrists know about human worth and dignity? We're writing it into every law these days, and I don't know anything about that term. All I know about is autonomy, and started me on this process. And indeed, we are writing it into the law or into our reports. And just to give you, I picked one example. Um, skip that quote uh, from the Belmont Report. And this was the report of the National Commission on the Protection of Human Subjects, which Karen knows very well. And it starts right out with basic ethical principles. Number one, respect for persons. Respect for persons incorporates at least two basic ethical convictions. You'll see that the two are really one. First, that individuals should be treated as autonomous agents. And second, that persons with diminished autonomy are entitled to protection. So the concept of autonomy is written in and it is equated in this report with dignity. Now, um, uh, Kant's position was very, very clear. The dignity or the worth of the human being was not based on our special reasoning powers, according to Kant, although he acknowledged that we were quite different from other animals in this way, but was based on our freedom, our autonomy. And I will quote briefly from Kant for you. He says, man in the system of nature is a being of slight importance. Although man has in his reason something more than they, other animals, and can set his own ends, even this gives him only an extrinsic value in terms of his usefulness. But man regarded as a person, that is, as the subject of morally practical reason, is exalted above any price. For as such, he is not to be valued as a mere means to the ends of others, or even to his own ends, but as an end in himself. He possesses, in other words, a dignity, an absolute inner worth, by which he exacts respect for himself from all other rational beings in the world. He can measure himself with every other being of this kind and value himself on a footing of equality with them. Um, he then goes on to say, autonomy then is the basis of dignity of human and of every rational nature. Uh, that last one stumped me. I didn't know what other rational nature there was besides uh, humans. Fortunately, at that time, we had a Kantian scholar uh, visiting at Hastings, and one of the things you learn uh, is that uh, education is a kind of wholesaling. You buy from the manufacturer uh, cheaply, and then you sell it to the consumer dearly. Uh, so I asked her what that meant, that peculiar uh, passage, and she said, well, Kant conceived of the idea that there might be rational life 
in other universes, and he didn't want to exclude them uh, from the principle uh, of dignity that he was espousing. So Kant was indeed looking far, far ahead. Now, in this sense, if we accept the Kantian sense of dignity, man's dignity actually starts, again in Genesis, with the fall. In other words, man did not have dignity while he was living in that Garden of Eden. He had a certain kind of respect and affection from his creator, but the dignity of man starts with the fall when he chose freedom and chose autonomy with all of its pain, suffering, and risk. He chose it, we're stuck with it, we have that risk, but we are elevated because of it. It is interesting when I check with biblical scholars about how that is treated, that the word sin is never used in relationship to the fall. That was not considered a sin, at least according to the biblical scholars that I check with, because that was part of the option design for man. And that the first sin actually was mentioned, the first use of the word Adam, which means sin in Hebrew in the Bible, um, was in relationship to Cain's attack on Abel. So we did not sin in doing it. We may have disappointed God. On the other hand, how are we to know? We may have uh, pleased him um, in that respect. Okay, having said all this, what's the problem? The problem started with a contemporary or with a, uh, um, a follower of Kant's, a man greatly influenced by him. The problem started in the late 19th century when psychiatry and psychology began to attack the concept of autonomy. Now, psychiatry and psychology are dominated, all psychology is dominated by two strong currents. One stemming from Freud, which I will call dynamic psychology, which sees people as in a dynamic state of tension involved with an unconscious, I'll go into that shortly. And the other is dominated from a stream starting from Pavlov through Watson uh, to B.F. Skinner, which is a behavioristic approach. This doesn't acknowledge feelings, emotions, unconscious. It is a measurable uh, science. It believes in studying rats and pigeons and making projections from them onto human beings. And it believes that behavior is all and all that is necessary to describe human activity. These two groups have nothing in common except that they intersect at one point. If there were a chart here, I'd draw a line going this way for dynamic psychiatry, ever upwards, this way for behavioral psychology, ever downwards. And I would say at the intersection is a concept called determinism. The one thing that they both agree on is that man is not free, that his behavior, which he sees as a voluntary choice at any time, is actually a product of inbuilt experiences, prejudices, and bias that will determine his behavior. So Freud, in his great discoveries, and I will stick to that field which I know best, evolved principles which made man less than a rational animal and certainly not a totally free agent. He decided that behavior was motivated towards the future. He decided that it was causally related to the past, that what your parents did to you, what your sister did, what your teachers did, all would influence your behavior. He decided that we did not operate in an actual world, but imposed a real world of our own perceptions onto that actual world. So that if each of us were exposed to certain stimuli, we would perceive them differently and therefore respond differently. And this is why an existential thinker like William Barrett will list Freud as an existentialist and will include him in his chapter in his book, The Irrational Man, as along with Dostoevsky, a believer in the passions, the irrational nature of our decisions. This concept of a dynamism, of a present that is determined is a product of the past, this concept that indeed the child is father of the man in ways that were not anticipated by the poet, wreaked havoc with the law and wreaked havoc with our sense of dignity. Under the influence of two giants, it's always the giants who cause us trouble, uh, Harold Laswell and David Bazelon. Harold Laswell was a professor of jurisprudence and a brilliant man, and David Bazelon was at one time the most powerful federal judge uh, in the country, short of the Supreme Court, and arguably even more so because the Supreme Court justice is one of nine, and he was one alone. They began to expand the concept of psychic determinism into the law, and we got into an absolute mess because the law demands responsibility, and in medicine we do not 
assume responsibility. If you come into me, it's an amoral profession. I've written that to a psychiatrist, innocence is an age and guilt is an emotion, and that's all we know about it. And if you come, we also operate under the sick role. If you come into me with a smelly abscess on your hand, I don't say, yick, get that ugly thing out of here. How dare you do that to me? I am aware that you are non-culpable, but if you are going to call every rape, every attack, every murder, if you are going to explain each of them under sociological exculpation or psychological exculpation, you are going to destroy the concept of responsibility, is indeed what's beginning to happen, but more important, you're going to fragment the real world and the common law, which depends on our having a common experience, is going to be distracted by the concept of multiple realities and multiple experiences. So this was a tack on um, our concept of the propriety of autonomy. It came to a culmination with the publication of a book called Beyond Freedom and Dignity uh, by B.F. Skinner. Beyond Freedom and Dignity was awarded by me the first Skinner Award, named in his honor. I have something I call the Skinner Quotient, which is the percentage of books sold to the percentage of books read. And I decided that the seven, of the 750,000 copies of Beyond Freedom and Dignity that were sold, probably 7,500 at most were read. It is a difficult, although an important book. And I was always amazed at how much praise it got from people who I assumed did not understand uh, its message. Although dignity is used in the title, it is never used in the book. And Dr. Skinner talks about beyond freedom and dignity, but he talks about autonomy. And in that sense, he's a true Kantian. And I was curious about why he used the word dignity and how he used it. I assumed he simply used it as a synonym for autonomy, and so I wrote him and asked, and I got, uh, not this answer, different answer, I got this answer. Uh, this is from a letter from Dr. Skinner. I use the word dignity rather in the French sense as meaning worth. I was concerned with the credit we give an individual for his achievements and the necessary erosion of that credit as a scientific analysis attributes more and more of a person's achievements to genetic, to genetic endowment and personal history. I am very much concerned about the misuse of the term rights and the think that the right to dignity is particularly objectionable. We defend ourselves against those who would deprive us of the chance to achieve and in doing so, I think, defend our right to achieve. Putting it in a different way, increasing knowledge of the causes of human behavior reduces the role of a supposed free agent to whom we credit behavior. The first reaction is to reject such a science, to reserve freedom and credit for what one has done. Now what Dr. Skinner goes on to say in that letter to me is to confirm the message of his book. He is frightened by our freedom. He is afraid that that freedom is going to destroy us. And he says that it is time to stop being free agents. He has the courage of his convictions the way some of the pessimists do not, and I have honored him for that. He says, if freedom is going to leave us, lead us to a holocaust, we don't want that kind of freedom. We better make sure that we breed that we design our descendants in such a way that they are not free to choose evil and to destroy us all. His answer, which is not necessarily the answer of Dr. Amundsen or uh, Dr. Lebeck, is what's the difference anyway? All I'm asking you to give up is an illusion. There is no such thing as freedom anyway. So when I ask you to give up your freedom, you're giving up simply a myth that comforts you at certain times, but it's an illusion. Um, now, under that uh, pressure, I tried to think, okay, maybe we're not free. Uh, I had a great opportunity to debate uh, Dr. Skinner uh, when we were both Chubb Fellows at Yale at the same time. Got to know him and to honor him and respect him, and he's a tough man to debate. And it was partly out of the stimulation of that that I began to think, suppose I assumed that there was no autonomy, which I do not. Are there not other ways, are there not other areas in which I can vest the special worth of the human being? 
and I think there are dozens. And since that time, I've been thinking of them, and I picked five out uh, to discuss with you uh, today. One is conceptual thought. Two is, I've changed that to the capacity for technology because technology has been getting a bum rap today, and I thought I'd defend that. Capacity for technology. Three is a range of emotions. Four is the fact that we are a Lamarckian animal, which means that, uh, I will discuss what that means. And five is something that is, if not autonomy, is very close to it, and that's freedom from instinctual fixation, which was what was indicated in those two uh, Renaissance or medieval quotes that I gave you early. Um, I see I'm running uh, short on time, so I'm going to cut some of this short, whiz through it, and maybe just give you some of my quotations. Conceptual thought is a purely human function and is a function of that extraordinary thing called the human brain. Um, I list only four aspects of it, and that is language, symbolism, anticipation, and imagination. Uh, but there are many ways in which you can think of conceptual thought. It is uniquely human. No other animal can do anything like it. A dog can say woof woof, meaning I want uh, a something, but he doesn't tell you whether he's in the mood for cheese or crackers or what, and he never will be able to, uh, nor will a computer. Um, language is the primary example. I know I had trouble with this in recent times when everybody seemed to be training apes uh, to do all sorts of interesting things, and the headlines in the science journals and the public press were, monkeys can talk. Uh, my retort to that, in case some of you are thinking of passing that question up, please don't tell me about it until they say something worth quoting. And uh, <laughs> then I'll get concerned uh, about our uniqueness. I was very happy to see uh, Herb, uh, um, I can't remember his name now, the, the, the man, uh, colleague of mine, uh, who trained Noam Chomsky. Uh, the uh, ape that presumably had a language all his own. He said he's really a dummy. He's no more than a computer uh, who responds and don't believe that he's speaking at all. And I find him a big bore. Uh, so that's from the man who created one of them. But um, one of my favorite, uh, all of my favorite philosophers are biologists, as you'll see. And one of my favorite is a man named Julian Huxley, who had this to say about it. Conceptual thought could have arisen only in a multicellular animal, an animal with bilateral symmetry, head and blood system, a vertebrate is against a mollusk or an arthropod, a land vertebrate among vertebrates, a mammal among land vertebrates. Finally, it could have arisen only in a mammalian line which was gregarious, which produced one young at birth instead of several, and which had recently become terrestrial after a long period of arboreal life. There is only one group of animals which fulfills these conditions. Thus, not merely has conceptual thought been involved, evolved only in man, it could not have been evolved except in man. Now, I suspect he had his tongue in cheek there, but it's a good quote anyway. Um, language and what we do with language is a nobling aspect of the human being. And indeed, Cicero based his concept of the uniqueness in man on language. And he has this little a parable, since everybody came up with their parables, I've got to have mine. And it goes like this. For there was a time when man wandered at large in the fields like animals and lived on wild fare. And they did nothing by the guidance of reason, but relied chiefly on physical strength. Although their ignorance and error, blind and unreasoning passion, satisfied itself by misuse of bodily strength, which is a very dangerous service. At this juncture, a man, a great and wise one, I am sure, became aware of the power latent in man. I'm skipping around. There's lots of dots in these quotations as for Cicero scholars, uh, I tell you that. He introduced them in every, to every useful and honorable occupation, though they cried out against it at first because of its severity. And then, when through reason and eloquence they had listened with greater attention, he transformed them from wild savages into a kind and gentle folk. And I think the fact that Cicero introduces eloquence, uh, meaning the use of ideas and the use of languages as the distinguishing feature, is not by chance. 
Now the next thing I have, I think, needs very little to say, and that's the use of symbolism. And symbolism allows us to do all sorts of extended things. Uh, the world of mathematics depends on symbolism, and uh, for purposes of brevity, I'm going to have to skip that discussion. Um, <clears throat> anticipation, I did want to mention. Anticipation is an enormous power of human beings. There is a kind of development, and again, I'm going to have to rush through it very briefly, uh, but for some of you who have read some of the things I've written, you know that I deal with it extensively in other areas. Uh, there is a development among the species for survival. The first creatures, the amoeba, have no sophisticated mechanism of survival. They ingest certain things, and if they're non-nutrient, they spit them out. If they're nutrient, they swallow them and digest them, and that's it. As you move up the ladder of biology, you begin to find that animals have a kind of tropism uh, towards nourishing things and away from painful things. You can see the design of God in this, if you wish, or you can simply see Darwinian anticipation. It's possible that that a mutant occurred at one time that simply loved poisons and fire and hated uh, veggies and things that on which one survives, but probably that mutant wouldn't have uh, uh, lasted very long, uh, uh, one generation. So you can see either mechanism of design. But that helped along the way. Then there were the development of the primary emotions, the stress emotions of fear and rage, which you share with a lot of lower ugly beasts. That meant that we could be frightened. You see, if you depend on pain alone, you only know that you're in danger when the alligator presses his uh, teeth into your flesh. At that point, it doesn't do you terribly much good to know that you're in a bad situation. But if you have the concept, if you'd once develop fear or rage, then you can anticipate the pain and run like hell. Now, in order to anticipate the pain, uh, you have to have something called distance receptors, a sense of smell. Touch alone will not do it because that's already there. You have to have a sense of smell, hearing, vision, what have you. That then allows for the kind of anticipation which allows for fear and rage responses to mobilize ourselves for the attack and you don't have to wait for the alligator. If you have imagination and anticipation, you don't even have to wait for the alligator. You can know that you shouldn't go walking in the swamps at night. And that's what we mean by anticipation. Now, anticipation also causes a great deal of problems. You can anticipate that which is going to come. You can also anticipate that which is never going to come, like cloned Hitler soldiers. In either case, we do know that the price we pay for freedom is anti uh, and anticipation is the possibility of creating terrors for our own amusement. Now, um, I will skip anticipation and go to imagination. And imagination, I think, is a sp specifically a human quality, and that allows us to be the poets and to experience, as Karen was suggesting, a kind of feeling that transcends pure rationality, the kind of learning that comes from love, relationships, uh, and from poetry. And there's a wonderful quotation which I choose to think uh, sometimes I twist these quotations to make them mean what I want them to mean. But this is a quotation uh, uh, from uh, Prometheus. Uh, the Prometheus legend uh, as Ovid uh, deals with it in his Metamorphosis. And uh, the Prometheus legend is an interesting one, which has always intrigued me, because there's two independent legends. The crime of Prometheus, according to one tradition, was that he created man, that he was the creator of our species. The uh, sin of Prometheus in another legend was that he gave fire, which is usually seen as a symbol of technology uh, to man, and that was his crime, that it was too great a gift to be given uh, to man. Um, I think that the answer may be that technology shapes our humanhood to such a gr great degree that the technological animal is the human animal, and there's simply two different versions of the same uh, uh, concept. But Ovid says, uh, and though all, he's talking about the creation that he made uh, Prometheus, the son of uh, Hephaestus, mixed with fresh running water and molded into the form of the all-controlling gods, molded us in God's image. Here again, an Old Testament thing. And though all other animals are prone and fix their gaze upon the earth, he gave to man an uplifted face and bade him stand erect and turn his eyes to heaven. And I think that this is a poetic expression by Ovid, the poet, about the aspiring nature of our species. 
um, the capacity for technology. Uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, in response to what he felt was an attack on science uh, by Dr. Labax, uh, said, no, 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 it isn't science that is the culprit, uh, it is technology. So in defending science, he dumped on technology. And he said nothing, uh, real facts and real truth, real knowledge never harmed anybody. Well, as a psychoanalyst, uh, I have almost the opposite uh, uh, thing. Uh, very few technical things. It's real knowledge that you are about to die, that you are an inadequate person uh, in, in relationship to those around you, that your wife was entitled to divorce you because you're a mean, nasty person. It's the real knowledge that is often the most painful and destructive things. But on the other, to be consistent uh, with my somewhat hyperbolic anthropocentric stand today, I would say that I'm not really much concerned about real knowledge. I don't really care about it until it's translated into action. I don't care if Dr. Thomas found something that conceivably could have said something about cancer until some of the technologists take that real knowledge and transfer it into a drug that can be used to relieve the misery. So science is the servant of technology, as far as I'm concerned, rather than technology being the kind of whore of science as it is often a thought to be. It is when those guys with their brilliant thoughts and their Nobel minds translate that stuff which I don't quite understand into the kind of comforts that promote decency among the poor and the rest of us that I realize the glories of science. So I'm all for technology. Uh, the third thing uh, is the range of emotions. Um, I'm going to have to skip that, uh, but I wrote a book on that called Feelings. But let me just tell you that while lower animals share with us guilt and fear, they don't share any of the nobler emotions. My wife, who's sitting in this audience, has argued with me for 20 years. She's convinced that when our dog does some outrageous canine feat, he's terribly guilty and he shouldn't be punished. That dog is never guilty. What she is seeing is guilty fear. He's terrified that he's going to be caught. Guilt is an entirely different emotion. The way I distinguish it is if you're going 65 miles an hour in a 40-mile speed zone and you hear, ah, the emotion you fear, feel is guilty fear. The test of it is if that cop passes you by and, and arrests the guy in the Porsche in front of you and you feel relief that's guilty fear. You no longer need to be... If you feel disappointment, that's true guilt. Uh, uh, so guilt, guilt is a uniquely human emotion uh, which expiates for wrongdoing. It implies that we have internalized a set of noble standards by which we judge ourselves and that if we have done wrong, we punish ourselves. In one outrageous do-good book, uh, whose name I will not dignify uh, before this audience, there's a chapter called uh, Guilt and Anxiety, the Useless Emotions. Now, anxiety is the principal emotion for individual survival, and guilt is the principal emotion for group survival. And by eliminating them, he eliminated two of the struts uh, on which our foundation, uh, by which our foundation is built. Uh, I do not worry about excessive guilt. I know it causes much pain. I am much more relieved than inadequate guilt. I am not thrilled when I find these young people who have managed to exercise all guilt and demonstrate it by earning their living by knocking little old ladies over the head with lead pipes to collect the $4.57 that's in their purse. Those are guiltless individuals, and I do not think that we're better off uh, for having them with us. Uh, the fourth point, which I must mention, is that we are a Lamarckian animal, and that, I think, cuts directly to our concerns uh, about uh, uh, genetic engineering. For those of you who are not biologists, there was a great debate uh, some 50 years ago resolved, I would say, about how the mechanisms of Darwinian uh, um, uh, evolution were transmitted, the genetic nature. There were two theories. One was Mendel's theory, which happened to be brilliant and happened to be true and was almost universally accepted, although quite late because Mendel worked in his backyard with sweet peas and he was a monastic person and we didn't hear too much from him. There was another theory, Lamarckian theory, that said acquired characteristics are transmitted. That's the whole idea that the giraffe, by stretching his neck for leaves, gets a longer neck and so his children. No one believed that except the Russians who are prone to believe whatever they choose to believe, and they suffered the sin of Lysenkoism by having a, 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 a totally decadent and destroyed agriculture uh, that they have yet to recover from. Um, 
The intriguing thing, however, is that in one species alone is it true that acquired characteristics are transmitted. And the power of culture, the power of being able to transmit on, we do not have to learn. After all, the things that an earthworm or a bird must know are genetically fixed. So they don't have to learn that because of genetic fixation. We are ge not genetically fixed. How in the world do we know how to start a fire, etc.? Do we have to relearn it each time? No. We have language, we have culture, and we can transmit it. And this is expressed most beautifully by a particular hero, and teacher, and mentor, and eventually friend of mine, uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky, uh, one of the great seminal thinkers, I think, in biology of our time. And in his book, and if you get nothing else out of this lecture, I urge that you read Mankind Evolving by Dobzhansky. Our genes determine our ability to learn a language or languages, but they do not determine just what is said. The structure of neither the vocal cords nor the brain cells could explain the difference between the speeches of Billy Graham and of Julian Huxley. Culture is not just another mechanism of adaptation. It is vastly superior to the biological mechanism which spawned it. It is more rapid and efficient. When genes are changed through mutation, the gene is transmitted solely to the specific offspring and only with generations of times enters into the species at large. Changed culture, on the other hand, may be transmitted to anybody regardless of biological parentage or borrowed ready-made from other people. In producing the genetic basis of culture, biological evolution has transcended itself. It has produced the super-organic. In other words, the kind of brain capable of conceptual reasoning is not only the product of a certain development, but is capable of dictating a future development. The fifth point I've already discussed, and that is our freedom from instinctual fixation. And I would make the point that if it we are not truly autonomous agents. That freedom from instinctual fixation is another definition as close to autonomy as is necessary uh, to ensure our dignity. Now, having said all of this, uh, isn't this a bit anthropocentric? Isn't this the product of a human being rather than a turtle? Uh, yes, uh, so what? Couldn't you turn Ovid upside down? And couldn't uh, uh, the uh, mice say, look, the human beings have their head up there in the air, airy, spacey things. We are down at the roots of the matter, at the fundaments of truth down here on the earth. That's obviously true, and I will be happy to in get involved in the first debate uh, with a mouse who writes that thesis. But so far, he hasn't, and I'm safe. And the reason I'm safe is expressed by another biologist who has influenced my thinking a great deal, a man named George Gaylord Simpson. The second piece of homework for you is to read the book, The Meaning of Evolution. And he says the following. Even when viewed within the framework of the animal kingdom and judged by criteria of progress applicable to that kingdom as a whole and not peculiar to man, man is the highest animal. It has often been remarked that if, say, a fish were a student of evolution, he would laugh at such pretensions on the part of an animal that is so clumsy in the water and that lacks such features of perfection as gills or a homocircle caudal fin. I suspect that the fish's reaction would be instead to marvel that there are men who question the fact that man is the highest animal. It is not beside the point to add that the, quote, fish, end quote, that made such judgments would have to be a man. Is it necessary to insist further on the validity of the anthropocentric point of view which many scientists and philosophers affect to despise? Man is the highest animal. The fact that he alone is capable of making such a judgment is in itself part of the evidence that this decision is correct. So what am I saying in conclusion? I am saying that I center my hopes on this freedom while I am not so foolish as to not share the fears of some of my other panelists. I recognize that that is a price we have always paid for it. But I also know that that is intrinsic to what makes our species worthwhile, that if we sacrifice that freedom, if we sacrifice that special inquiry, that capacity to look to the stars, to reach out for something new, we cease to be that which is worth saving. 
And I have very little sympathy for people like Singer who talk of the rights of animals, although I respect that human dignity would demand that we treat uh, animals with a certain amount of worth. And I certainly do not go along with Stone in the feeling that trees should have standing. If any place, I stand with William James in basing the entire moral universe on the nature of human beings. And I am in good company here. I would like to quote first before James a quote from Whitehead in which he talks about the fact that people talk about how beautiful the sun set and as I have pointed out to students, the sun doesn't even set except in the perception of man. And he says, that's the trouble with having new ideas that if you read long enough they become uh, cribs from somebody else. Thus nature gets credit which should, this is from Whitehead, thus nature gets credit which should in truth be reserved for ourselves the rose for its scent, the nightingale for his song, and the sun for his radiance. The poets are entirely mistaken. They should address their lyrics to themselves and should turn them into odes of self-congratulation on the excellency of the human mind. Um, I want to close with this one quotation, which seems to me to sum up uh, my anthropocentrism and my faith in the moral and nature of human relationships. And this is from William James. And he says, we have learned what the words good, bad, and obligation severally mean. They mean no absolute nature is independent of personal support. They are objects of feeling and desire which have no foothold or anchors in being apart from the existence of actually living minds. Wherever such minds exist with judgments of good and ill and demands upon one another, there is an ethical world in its essential features. Were all other things, gods and men and starry heavens, blotted out from the universe, and were there left but one rock with two live loving souls upon it, that rock would have as thoroughly moral a constitution as any possible world which the eternities and immensities could harbor. It would be a tragic constitution because the rock's inhabitants would die. But while they lived, there would be real good things and real bad things in the universe. There would be obligations, claims and expectations, obediences, refusals and disappointments, compunctions and longings for harmony to come again, and inward peace of conscience when it was restored. There would, in short, be a moral life whose active energy would have no limit but the intensity of interest in each other with which the hero and the heroine might be endowed. Thank you. Yes, I will need all of I have, um, while we make the transition, a comment and a parable. A certain man from Minnesota went to Las Vegas for a two-day visit. On the first day, he won the jackpot in the slot machine, and he went to bed happy. On the second day, he played another slot machine and won the jackpot and went to bed happy and the next day home. And his wife asked him which was the largest jackpot. And he answered, you decide. Oh dear. <laughs> we had two jackpots anyway. The other comment is that when we make choices about titles, we uh, include or omit. We chose manipulating, and it has two possible meanings. It can be an adjective, and it can be a verb. The way the title reads, manipulating life, assumes that there is someone manipulating something else. Our original title was manipulating man. And it assumes, I think, a little more that the human is a manipulator, and that is a moral affair.
and not just technical. I invite the uh, other persons on the panel to come forward and we'll continue our conversations. And um, would you bring your questions to the ushers, please? I will give you 30 seconds more of your interesting dialogues, and then we'll begin the conversation up here. Um, comments? Yeah. I don't want to lead off. No, OK. Does anyone want to lead off? Do you have comments? Uh, they are not hearing me down there. Yeah. Find out if any of them want to comment, will you? Yeah, okay. I'll go ask. early in the day, too. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will begin the conversation uh, up here first. I already have several interesting questions which we will put to the panel. Uh, Karen Labax. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have the freedom I, to say no. <laughs> uh, I have a comment and a question. My comment has to do with going to scripture as a resource for our thinking. One does need to be careful to do that not with preconceived notions which will be supported by the scriptural text, but with a genuine openness to what the text itself has to say. And I would only point out that in Genesis, at the point where the description is given of Adam, which means humankind, not a man, being created in God's own image. My understanding is that the Hebrew term used there for God is the word Elohim, which is a plural word. So it is again possible that God here is imaged as both male and female, and that the creation of Adam, humanity in the image of God, is a reference to sexuality, not to our creative abilities, our ability to change our own nature and all sorts of other things. Now my question has to do with where we locate what is distinctive to human beings or what might be considered to be our dignity or our worth. Um, I, I am delighted in general, Will, with almost everything that you have said, and I don't disagree with most of it, but I do wonder whether in your locating of what is distinctive to humans, you have not left out something that we might learn from the text itself, taken in its entirety, not only those two or so verses from Genesis that seem to serve your purposes. And if we take the text in its entirety, we find both in the prophets and particularly in the New Testament, a different understanding of what might constitute the nature or the dignity of humankind, which has to do with how we use power and with our choice not to use power and not to let force be the determining factor for human beings. So because it seems to me that I could derive a different understanding of what is really central to humans, I, I really want to ask you what standard should we use 
for making decisions about what is crucial or central to the dignity of human beings. You've drawn on biology, which is understandable. You've drawn on psychology, which is also understandable. But what are the standards for choosing where we go for our understanding of human nature? I think that's a reasonable and good, good question. I think there are three f sections to it. Let me deal with the first two. I'm more than happy to accept the androgyny of God, uh, whom I never quite visualize in any image. So if you choose to have it uh, a woman or a man or a hydra or anything, uh, the, I'm not stuck on the images of God. Um, no, so um, the quotations that use man a lot uh, are quotations from people uh, of a different time, and I, I stick to the quotations rather than modifying them, and I apologize if that offends some people. Um, the second thing about um, the quotation from the Bible, working in interdiscipline, I learn never to quote from the law without checking a lawyer. I took that text from Genesis, uh, having been in a adjunct professor at Union Theological Seminary, uh, to my colleagues at Union Theological Seminary, and to my friends at Jewish Theological Seminary. And while we all know that the Old Testament encompasses all prejudices, all biases, and you can find everything, I found a rather unanimity of opinion in both sources, and that may be modern, uh, that that meant dominion, and it meant a command uh, to utilize the species, uh, and that it meant the specials. Were, and I also asked about the distinction between sex and reason, and I got the answer that the transcendent view was that the uh, uh, current view of the Adam and Eve story was that it dealt with rationality, reason, and autonomy. I recognize that at one time that was seen sex, but we all know that sex is duller than logic, and so I prefer uh, to go on uh, and accept the second. The third on where I root uh, is the most interesting part of your question. I have enough faith in the dignity and specialness of our species that I would predict from whatever bias or from whatever professional expertise you start, you would find lists of things that make us different. Um, so, of course, as a biologist, as someone trained in biology and someone trained in psychology, I draw on biological and psychological roots. Uh, if I were a geneticist, as Dobzhansky was, I would draw on genetic distinctions. If I were a poet, I would draw on that. But I have enough confidence in the specialty of our species that I think from whatever standpoint, theological or wherever you would start, you would end up uh, having uh, uh, a hosanna for homo sapiens. I think that we are indeed special, and I think that we could all, it would be a wonderful, wonderful volume. If you chose to edit it, I will contribute to it uh, to have uh, contributions on what I had as my alternatives titled this, What's So Special About Human Beings? I will tell you about the title of my speech, which Karen was a little upset because it said, uh, what was the title of it? It had man in it. Uh, Man-made Oh, uh, the man-made animal. That is a quotation uh, from Josh Letterberg, um, who uh, uh, in an article, and I couldn't find the citation, I, I will have to get it from him, but I remember it very distinctly, where he was talking about worried about other things. He said, man is the only man-made animal. And so uh, that is a quotation from, from him. That doesn't uh, Karen wants to respond. Uh, Karen? Uh, just, just to say that um, while one should always use quotes as they originally appear, unless you can make it clear that you've changed the language for some specific reason, that does not excuse us from trying to be more inclusive in the remainder of our language and not to assume that the term man includes all of humankind, women as well as men. Uh, are there, isn't there a quotation in Genesis, in his image he made them, male and female he made them? The Bible, uh, Genesis passage, uh, as I remember it says, male and female he created them. So there's an androgynous base right in the original. Uh, uh, June Goodfield. I'm in a most 
extraordinary situation right now because my overpowering desire can be summed up in one phrase, I want to go home. And the reason why I think I want to go home is because I'm beginning to wonder, you know, why we're here at this moment. We clearly have a community in Gustavus, in the surrounding Minnesota, of people who care very deeply about the problems which have coalesced into the question of this conference. We clearly have on this panel a group of remarkable professional people, highly ethical, who care also very deeply about the questions at issue and who would never dream, I'm sure, of doing any of the things which have from time to time brought their professional institutions into any kind of disrepute. After hearing the lecture so far, why I feel I want to go home is because I begin to feel, if I ask the question, where did we go wrong? The answer is, well, we haven't gone wrong. And if I ask the question, what is the problem? Well, the answer is, there isn't any problem. So I feel reduced to the poor person who, on the deathbed of Gertrude Stein, was saying to her, Gertrude, Gertrude, what is the answer? Only to receive this phrase, well, what's the question? Now, now, you know, I could partly have wished that the organizers had chosen to have represented on this panel one good old S of a B of a scientist who has <laughs> regularly, uh, and I'm sure a few of them exist, who have regularly, uh, let's say, um, defiled the ethic of his profession. I'd love to have had one of those doctors who, whose actions precipitated what I found was an extremely good BBC television program and a very honest one several years ago with the title, Am I doing this for you, doctor, or are you doing this for me? And I have heard a, you know, I have heard, and it's wonderful that I do have, that I do have, I have heard such optimistic assessments of everything as to, as I say, generate this feeling of sort of utter futility in our presence on the platform today. And the only thing I can do at the moment is to say to Will, Will, with all the optimism, yes, with all the things I agree there, you know, Gertrude, Gertrude, is there a problem? Or Will, Will, is there a problem? Oh. Indeed, I, I do think there is a problem. Uh, I thought that I was the house optimist, and that was uh, uh, partly my role. And I, I do feel that there are limits to our nature and that stretching those limits. I, I wrote uh, a whole book on that on, uh, called Caring, in which I was concerned that we were stretching the limits of our nature. I used the example of the elks of the horn, that you're allowed to change yourself. I mean, the horns of the elk. Um, <laughs> The uh, spe a certain species of, uh, dare I say it, I think a Norwegian elk, since that seems to be a sub-theme of this conference, Norwegians, um, a Norwegian elk that developed a bigger and bigger antlers, which provided it with a step up uh, in, in adaptation, because they could intimidate the other elks and they could uh, monopolize the breeding ground. Uh, so they indeed then uh, began to develop these elaborate sets of horns until they got caught in the trees and they destroyed themselves. And in an essay, Irish. yes, Irish, that's right. Uh, in uh, same thing. Uh, uh, in uh, this essay, I questioned about whether modern civilization might not be uh, the uh, horns of the elk. So I'm aware of that. When you say, what is the question, I guess I'm drawing on those ghosts on the wall, uh, in which, as I understood uh, Karen when she did it, she gradually eliminated all those ghosts. Then I'm not clear on the purpose of telling ghost stories when you eliminate the ghosts. I do think there are questions, and I am distressed when the anxiety, which is an authentic anxiety, and which Dr. Skinner felt about an atomic holocaust, is displaced into the more manageable, the more convenient, and the more spook story, meaning that we have the reassurance at hand, the more spooky story of recombinant DNA and genetic engineering and long-armed apes who are gonna do this, that, and the other. I do think there are questions. I think there is an importance to this conference 
to dispel the concept that there is anxiety about creating demi-life that's going to empty our garbage for us. That's the kind of spook story kids tell so that they don't have to face the real world. And I think that what's happened is we're on a high. We get a kick out of being scared about something we know isn't a real danger. I do not see genetic engineering a danger. I see atomic holocaust a danger. And I want all that energy and all that displaced stuff and all those books about the bogeyman taken away and face the real problems, which are not of the high technology of the future, but the rather mundane low technology of the past. You know, um I absolutely, you know, this is fine, Will, I absolutely agree with what you said, and I thought you were going to say this, and you understand why I felt I had to, you know, raise the issue that I did. And in raising this in this form, and if, as I think I will try and do tonight, is to take a wider view of human morality and human responsibility to this, then I hope the one thing that I'm not going to be accused of then is just downright irrelevancy. Because if you do sweep these questions, you know, that for me, they are ghosts on the wall, too. I'm sorry, in the sense that you mean, I mean, I don't have the, the widely shared fears about genetic engineering. I stand very closely with you here. But on the other hand, I do have a lot of worries about the present human condition, which I think pertain to this conference, because I cannot believe that you can separate this one set of questions out and deal with them quite separately. Here in the box, and then I have a question that relates to this last comment. Maybe we will engender more disagreement than we thought we had here. The ghosts are on the wall, and they are real and serious problems. Who defines what constitutes a defect and where the line should be drawn between correcting defects and improving or simply trying to change the way we are as human beings? That's not a ghost that can simply be dismissed. It is a ghost in the sense that it is not the monster, and I have tried to distinguish what I consider to be the real underlying problem. So for me, in answer to June's question, is there a problem? Yes, there is a problem, and the problem is that we are not free from the presuppositions that we bring with us as we look at these issues and from our tendency to cling to those presuppositions and to assume that we are asking the right questions and that we can use our own paradigms to get the right answers. I would only point out that in answer to my question about the sources for our knowledge about human beings, Will has responded by saying, I have faith in human beings, I have confidence in. Part of the issue for me is, what should we have faith in? What should we have confidence in? And for those of you who are interested in finding a non-anthropocentric view, you might take a look at James Gustafson's magnum opus, the culmination of a life's work in Christian ethics called Ethics from a Theocentric Perspective, in which he argues precisely that human beings are not the measure of all things and that all of those wonders of nature are wonderful in themselves and in God's view whether humans exist or not and that when the cockroaches survive after all the rest of us are wiped out by the nuclear holocaust that will mean that we are gone but it will not mean that God is gone. I there are a couple of um, questions that um, need to be brought to your attention that come from the audience. Uh, the first one, Dr. Galen, why does a desire for human modesty and caution and an awareness of human capacity for evil negate a sense of awe and appreciation for human creation? The questioner seems to uh, sense that you are uncomfortable with these uh, rather opposing impulses. Uh, I'm not clear. Uh, the, uh, the, I didn't, against love, you mean? Um, on one hand, human modesty and a sense of caution about our capacity for evil, however you want to make of that term, and on the other hand, the sense of awe about and appreciation of human creativity. 
that these coexist in us. Are you comfortable with the coexistence? Totally. Uh, I'm always uncomfortable when there is no ambiguity and no ambivalence. I distrust clear answers. Uh, I was taught by some good teachers. I'll tell you a little anecdote. It gives me an excuse for using it. It's something I cut from my presentation uh, to save time. But I had a wonderful course uh, in philosophy as a freshman, I taught by a man with an extraordinarily heavy Greek accent, Raphael Dimas. And so I apologize for using the accent, but it's part of the charm of the story. And he tells the story on himself that he never understood Americans well. Uh, he didn't understand. He used to write notes about Americans in his book, and he, one note he wrote is that Americans like bargains. They want the most for their money because he saw things for $4.99 instead of $5. And so when a class was canceled on a Thanksgiving, he rescheduled it on Sunday, whereupon his students hissed him. And he wrote in the book, Americans like the most for their money, except in education where they like less for their money. And that was the way his mind worked. And he described this story that at the end of a class, a student came up to him and said, that Professor Demos, uh, uh, you're a nice man, and I don't want to hurt your feelings. He said, but I have to tell you, your course has been a total failure. And Professor Demos says, oh my goodness, please tell me why. And he said, well, uh, I attended every lecture, and I did every re reading, and I studied it very hard, and I want you to know that I don't know anything more now than when I came in in September. And Demos put his head in his hand and said, my God, you're right. It's, of course, is a failure. You're supposed to know less now than when you came in. <laughs> There are, uh, there's a cluster of questions uh, uh, responding reactively, I think, or protractedly, to uh, the uh, exclusive emphasis on human dignity. And um, I'll read one or two of them so you can respond, uh, Dr. Galen and others. One of them says, you realize that man could not have his world as he sees it without the other animals and trees. It's an ecological perspective, I presume. If man does not care for these things or about these things, he has no worth, for he would not exist. Anthropocentrism should not include such arrogance that man forgets his dependence upon the world at large. Um, is it not by comparison with animals and plants that man gains his sense of dignity? Must they not therefore be present and hence given their own dignity to give man dignity? Those I are... agree with all of those statements, and I'm glad they were made. It's part of the rush and, and part of perhaps the inadequacy of an oral presentation that I, I did not express that adequately. It is essential to an anthropocentric position to respect all of these things. Of course I respect the beauty of nature. Of course I respect the fact that we treat with gentleness and kindness animals, that we, res that we value our environment. What I tried to make was perhaps the more subtle and sophisticated point that the value of all of these things must not be minimized, but they are, in a sense, to serve the perceptions, I think I used three words, beginning with a P, I can't remember them now, the perceptions, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, pleasures, uh, and the purposes of the human species. And I think we would be destroying ourselves when we make ourselves unkind, when we make ourselves proud and arrogant, as I was accused of being, uh, when we make ourselves ungentle, uh, and that the way we treat uh, things and animals is a reflection on where we are and a measurement of it, and the rewards of those are part of our purposes. I guess I was addressing myself to a kind of violent self-hatred. As an analyst, that's the greatest danger, not pride, you know, a self-hatred, that I saw in a student generation that saw human beings as the corruptors uh, of nature and saw nature as having an existence. To Karen, I would say that uh, Jim Gustafson and I are uh, uh, dear antagonists, uh, and I would say that indeed we do stand on opposite uh, ends of this case. Uh, not being a uh, theistic uh, individual, it is hard for me to have a theocentric um, base to my philosophy, although I know that most of my friends and 
uh, all of my betters uh, do have a theistic center. And so I acknowledge that it may be a deficiency in me. Nonetheless, I have to build on that which I have. Uh, Christi uh, Christian Anthonson, please. Uh, just a comment about the use of a word in your lecture, namely Lamarckian. I mean, this Lamarckianism is uh, the passing of acquired characteristics on to the next generation. And I doubt very, very much if you mean that you're your person who had been trained as a child to appreciate Dostoevsky, for example, was going to have kids that sprang out of the crib reading Dostoevsky in the next generation, which wouldn't happen. No, this, again, um, when I say I'm a Lamarckian, uh, I have to be careful. I'm surrounded by, indeed, all my betters in biology. I'm using a metaphor that I borrowed from Dobzhansky in which he says that even though we don't do it genetically, human beings are in a peculiar way, Lamarckian, that culture becomes the substitute for genes. It's just simply an elaborate metaphor that he that, uses. That's okay, you know, with that evasive uh, interpretation, it's okay. <laughs> uh, Dr. Tom Thomas. I, I would like to uh, uh, add a word in support of, of Dr. Galen's uh, comments about the overarching importance of the nuclear threat, but I want to be sure that what he intended to say was the nuclear bomb rather than nuclear power. I think we have the same problem worrying ourselves into fits of anxiety about nuclear power and therefore somehow diminishing the, the radius of all dangers. I should add also some question is, I, I don't want to attack Dr. Dr. Galen's uh, enthusiasm about our species. I, I tend to share it uh, with, I think, somewhat less than, than, uh, than his present satisfaction with this. My view about us, I would say, was expressed in a line from one of the Gilbert and Sullivan uh, plays where someone announces that what he feels is modified rapture. <laughs> and that's about where I stand. Uh, and I have a, a small quarrel with him. Um, by the way, you can always tell that when we are going to quarrel, we say, I couldn't agree with you more. Or, but um, I'm not so sure it's, it's uh, safe to be quite as dismissive of the world of animals as having no minds at all in the sense that we possess minds. I have in my time known uh, three uh, almost incapacitatedly guilt-ridden dogs. <laughs> and, and, and I remember a year ago spending some time in British Columbia at Vancouver where they have a, an excellent zoo where contained therein is one of the very best of, of displays of aquatic mammals uh, and several uh, whales accompanied by dolphins are, are swimming about in a, in a good sized pool and it's my conviction that when a new young whale is added to that group, there's a certain conversation that goes on, and it's well known that they are communicating anyway. What is being said to the youngest whale is, look, there are some fairly smart uh, people out there, and if you just swim around three times, we've got that chap trained to hold up a fish, and then if you get out of the water, you can actually get him, if he's quick enough, to feed it to you. Very smart animals. Uh, uh, may I pose another question? Okay. Uh, there is a, a sense of uh, unrest uh, in uh, maybe more than one place in the audience about what seems to be a cultural bias. And uh, one question has come here. Uh, I find disturbing the unquestioned 
or the exclusive dependence on the Judeo-Christian documents as cultural touchstones, what about the other two-thirds of the world? Uh, in this time of uh, cultural dialogue and interchange, there are other great traditions. Should they not also be given equal weight, or at least some weight, as implications for the future directions of the human race? Anyone comment on that? Maybe it's a question that we all need to ponder since we're all Western products, or most of us are. I, I certainly agree that the more open we are, uh, the more educated we are, uh, the, the more um, sophisticated our knowledge, the happier we would all be. Uh, I would like to have the knowledge of uh, other fields that I don't have. I would like to know uh, um, biology the way Dr. Grobstein does. I would like to know uh, physics the way some of my friends who are physicists are. Um, I do find that when I turn to other traditions, I'm uncomfortable. I had some quotations from Mencius, uh, whom I attacked vigorously, uh, and from uh, Confucius and Lao Tse. I'm uncomfortable with them because I am such an amateur in those traditions. I have a feeling I'm exploiting it. Um, so what can I say? I can say this. When I speak, I do not speak with the sensitivity of a um, um, I mean, I try to transcend my time by going, I don't see the Judeo-Christian tradition. I've always found that a very silly uh, statement. I feel that there is more conflict between Judaic views of man and Christian views of man than in any other two cultures I know of. Uh, one being communitarian, the other being individualistic, uh, one emphasizing justice and law, the other emphasizing love and salvation. I mean, I, see, I find all kinds of differences. I do think there's a problem. I don't know how to handle it. When I come, I speak from my tradition, although I'm open-ended. I guess I uh, say to you, it's all your fault, Dr. S. Bjornsson. Uh, you invited a uh, Middle Western, white, Jewish uh, psychiatrist uh, of a certain age, uh, and uh, that's what you got. And. <laughs> I'll accept the uh, condemnation, but I will not allow the guilt to immobilize me. <laughs> there are a couple of questions. One came in early and one later that, uh, that I think are interesting because it, I have often wondered whether uh, we humans are the last word in the creation. The first question was a brief one. What if, do we fear being uh, second best to another biological being? And the other one was, look at uh, conventional theology, and I might add other realms of thought have been upset by past advances in understanding the world is round and not flat, etc. What if we become aware of the existence of forms of life superior to the humans in outer space? Or what if we even create our own successors, I might add? Is there a fear among us of uh, something better than we are, or are we the last word ever? Dr. Thomas. There's a hope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that when we meet the unisex being, I better be very careful, we don't wait for an introduction, Lou. Uh, that we this, this question was asked at another conference just before in a somewhat different way. He said, someone said, supposing, uh, although there I share the hope, I, I, it would be very exciting. I, I also hope that they're kind to these superior creatures. <laughs> yeah. But someone said uh, at a conference, asked me a question, well, supposing we made a robot and the robot were capable of uh, uh, thinking and creating and talking and loving and were every way like a human being. And what would you would think about that? Wouldn't that be just as good as we are? And I, I thought for a moment, I said, well, wait a second. If the robot were indeed capable of all those things I listed uh, here before, imaginative, creative, poetic, and to use the biological test, capable of recreating its own kind, which is the definition of the species, I'd invite him to dinner. <laughs> so I felt that. 
All yes, right. I would welcome in, into the family of the human species such a robot. Thank you. Um, we should bring this uh, session to a close. May I say that we are overwhelmed up here with questions. This afternoon at 3.30, we'll try to call out some that uh, uh, seem to be attractive to us and, and have a panel about them. Before you leave, just a minute, please. I have a very interesting announcement. Maybe some of you already have heard this. The Nobel Peace Prize winner this year is Lech Walenza. I, I have one announcement. Tonight, those of you who have no banquet tickets and who may wish to hear June Goodfield may do so by convening in the Three Crowns room, which is right off the canteen end of the food service building, around 8 p.m. You are welcome to participate in that session without a dinner ticket. See you at 1.30, 1.20.